Good morning, New Hope. Good morning. Uh, usually when we, uh, when you're getting ready to speak and things like that, worship is kind of hard, right? Because your mind's on this and prepared about what's about to happen. But uh, this morning I found myself worshiping with you guys. Thank you so much for that. That uh, kind of forgot I had to speak for a moment there and had to kind of refocus your mind on what's about to happen rather than what just did happen. I'll tell you this. Um, uh, for someone who shares a wall with, uh, with Pastor Rick, uh, that, that is a genuine worship that you see. Where Pastor Rick is in a rare form, singing and, and uh, moving around so well like that. We love that. That is not a performance that you see here. Uh, the only thing that's missing is the big desk slam uh, that I hear going through the wall when he's so excited about whatever song he's singing. You know, we hear that all the time in the office that uh, it, this is not something uh, that a performance that we see here, but rather the way that uh, we choose to live our life and worship to God. So thank you guys that has now gone behind me. Thank you <laughs> for, for worshiping with it. What a great time. <clears throat> Such great worship. There was at least three people in our row crying. Um, they were all Browers, but they were, they were all crying there. <laughs> uh, thank you for, for allowing me to be here today. Uh, I'm not Pastor Craig. If, uh, if this is your first time here at New Hope, we appreciate you guys being here. If uh, you've been watching online for a while and this is your first time actually being on campus with us, uh, thank you for being here. My name is Christian Brower. Uh, Pastor Craig is not with us today. Uh, he gave me this opportunity. He carries uh, the brunt of the, the speaking load uh, at New Hope Church here. He's our, our senior and uh, teaching pastor. But uh, has uh, given me a gracious opportunity to present Isaiah chapter 19 as study to you today. So thank you for that. Um, yes. Are you clapping for Pastor Craig? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, mo on most Sundays, I am at the, the western end of the building over here. Not, not on this part, but the western end where we call the New Hope Kids Zone. I have the distinct honor and privilege and, uh, and burden uh, to, to care for your kids. I mean that in, in a very real sense, that we take the spiritual care of your kids very seriously. It's nothing we take lightly. So thank you for allowing us and our team to partner with you, with your kids and grandkids and younger brothers and sisters, uh, that we care for them and, and their spiritual needs on Sundays as best we can to help you through the rest of the week. So thank you. I will say that when I was in college 10, 11 years ago, studying business administration and marketing and things like that, it was never on my goal sheet, anything like that, to work at a church, uh, nor to be in children's ministry especially, but that's uh, amazing how the Lord takes your desires and the things that you ought to be doing uh, and matches them perfectly with his will, uh, and I'm thankful for that. So thank you uh, for the last eight years of my life now being here. I'm great, grateful. Uh, to partner with you guys in, in ministry for the Lord. So uh, thank you for that. We are in Isaiah. So uh, a, a, as a church, New Hope typically goes through books of the Bible. We don't preach topically, but rather teach uh, through a book of the Bible. So if we're in Genesis, we go Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4. If we're in John, we go John 1 straight through on. But for Isaiah, it's a little bit differently. This is a prophet. We're teaching it thematically. We're kind of jumping around chapter to chapter based on the themes that God is presenting to Isaiah and then to the people of Israel. Uh, so uh, when, when it first started, if you show the themes up here to start, uh, the, the first theme was about the, put them up there, thank you, the problem of sin. The problem of sin, that we are not good people on our own. That we are not good enough to pull ourselves up with our own action or our giving or our church attendance or whatever it is. That that will be good enough for us. But rather that we need an all-sufficient Savior. That sin is deep within us and we cannot uh, get rid of it on our own. The problem of sin that he presents to Israel and also presents to us. Then around December, <clears throat> we moved on to the hope of a uh, Messiah, the hope of a Messiah. There's lots of prophecy in Isaiah speaking towards the future king of Israel. We know that now to be Jesus, right? We know that Jesus came and was born in a stable, a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. At the time, they were hoping for an earthly king, right? Someone that would come that would take over Israel and dominate their foes and, and, and reign supreme in the world here today. But that's not what they got. They got a humble king that would come and not just uh, rule over Israel, but rule over heaven and earth. And now as we talk about the freedom of redemption, the freedom of redemption, the hope of redemption, we see thematically throughout the whole book of Isaiah that number one, it starts with two things. If you put it up there in the next slide here, two things. Number one is the judgment of Israel mostly. It shows God's judgment of Israel and their rebellion. This is the whole theme. Everything goes back and forth with you in these two things. The judgment of God's people that one, God has noticed the rebellion, that it does not go unnoticed, and two, that it does not come without cost. 
That the rebellion does not come without cost. But on the other side of that, it shows the redemption of that. And the freedom that comes with that, not the freedom that's simply that if we do whatever we want, whenever we want, that we are free. But rather that when we are redeemed, when we are purchased back into God's goodness and into his family, that that's where our true freedom is. That's what we're going to talk about today. God's judgment and then his freedom. You'll see it all over Isaiah. If you have your Bibles open to chapter 19, you'll recognize something right away. That uh, this is not to Israel. Isaiah was a prophet for Israel. He heard from God and then God would tell him what to, what to say or what he was thinking about the world or about Israel typically. And then he would present it to Israel. These prophecies that would come. This is not to Israel. In fact, this is from a competing and an enemy nation of Egypt. Fascinating what God has to say, not about his own people, Israel, but about Egypt. Listen along. Here's what it says right here. It's on the screens. Uh, read along with me as I read it along. It says, this is ver uh, chapter 19, verse 1. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence. The hearts of the Egyptians will melt within them. I will stir up Egyptian against Egyptian. They will fight each other, each against each other. Other translations say brother against brother, family against family, each against their neighbor, neighbor against neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. The spirit of the Egyptians within them will be emptied out. That's a pretty scary warning. Can you imagine the God of the universe coming and saying, every relationship you have with somebody is going to take a toll here. This is my prophecy for you. This is my warning of what's going to happen. Your relationship with your idols, your God, Right, is going to tremble. I'm going to show you the true power of your idols, which is nothing. Only the mighty hand of God right, can overcome that. I will show you the true uh, power of their idols. They will tremble in my presence. You are a brother against brother in your families. Your family relationships are going to take a hit. Family against family, uh, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. All the relationships with everybody they had relation to are going to take a hit because of what God is about to purpose here. If that would be enough, you'd think, goodness, we need to change the direction of our, we need to change our ways as a nation. This is bad enough if every one of these things, it says this, the heart of Egyptians will melt within them. It doesn't mean that they're like melting because they're in love, but rather that every sense of courage or bravery that they have will be sapped from them. They will be dispirited. Think of this in, in a military uh, uh, way in, in Egypt. You've got the big, great, greatest, strongest military in the world, these huge uh, military that's trying to dominate a quarter of the world at the time. And being told that you will be dispirited, that you will, your hearts will melt, you will have no courage or bravery. Imagine what it does. Think about the relationship between them and their idols, them and their neighbors and their brothers and sisters and against other kingdoms. All of them are promised to suffer, even their relationship with themselves as their hearts will melt. If that was bad enough, we could move on from that and say, Lord, help us. But it's not. He says, I'm going to go worse. Here's what happens next. I will confound their counsel, he says. I will give over the Egyptians into the hand of a hard master. The waters of the sea will be dried up. The river will be dried and parched. Its canals will become foul. The branches of the Egypt's Nile will diminish and dry up. The reeds and rushes will rot away. There will be bare places by the Nile. The fishermen will mourn and lament. The workers in combed uh, flax will be in despair. All who work for pay will be grieved. Think about all the different ways that God is promising destruction to this nation. There's no hope in this yet. It would be bad enough if it was just the, the relational side of it, right? We talked about that, about having every sort of relationship you have in turmoil. Because of, but it gets worse. Look at all the other ways that it shows. Even the emotional aspect of it. Put the next slide up, please. The emotional aspect of what's going to happen in their lives. It says right here that the spirit of the Egyptians within them will be emptied out. Guys, listen. I'm going to take probably two or three minutes on each of these. And it's going to be hard because it's going to be a downer. And it's going it's to feel like we're, we're getting hammered over and over again. But there's a point to this because I want you to feel the great depths of how low these people must have felt of what God was going to purpose and was going to do to them. I want you to understand every layer of the destruction that's coming. Number one is relational. The second one, they talk about the emotional despair that's going to happen. It says their spirits will be emptied out. Imagine what that feels like. 
Have you ever had a moment where you get a phone call that you recognize that that phone call is going to change everything about your life? Or you have a conversation with somebody, all of a sudden you have a moment with somebody that you recognize something, is, something just changed in my life forever. Your brain like records that moment, right? You remember what it smells like or where you were driving or how fast you were going or who was on the phone or what it smelled like around you or, or what you were supposed to do that day and what got dropped and you just forgot about because everything changed in your life. That's what God's talking about. He says your, the spirits will be taken from them. They will be emptied out. Everyone knows that feeling, right? When you recognize that everything is going to be taken from you emotionally. God says, that's what's coming to the Egyptians. And then it gets worse. He talks about the economics of it, right? The workers are going to lament. And all these people in the fields, they're going to cry out and they're, and they're going to be sad. And the economics of Egypt are going to be gone. Their economy, he promises, to be destroyed, you notice in your life or in your businesses or even in a church or in America, wherever it is, that when things in our money system aren't right, everything else takes a hit. We know that, right? We know what a huge issue this is going to be for them. That when your money is a problem in your family, every other relationship, everything else gets hurt. In churches, when there's money issues, people start to fight, right? In America, when there's money, <laughs> we know where that's going, okay? There's all kinds of problems. When the economy is hit of a nation, everything else gets hurt. That's what he's promising. But it's not just like their ability to thrive that he's talking about. It's worse because he even mentions the agriculture. He says there will be spots of dry land across the Nile where you usually plant and where you harvest food, not only to sell, but to eat and to give to your husbands and wives and to your uh, kids. Even their very sustaining self that they're trying to give them, even the, the, sustain, the sustenance of their food, he's taking from them. That's different than the economy, right? Because we can say, you know, it's hard to thrive, but like we can find food and we can survive and we can push through this. But even to say that their food is going to be gone continues to push them deeper and deeper and deeper into this hole. I always have this thought <laughs> that uh, if America ever like just, if the economy goes to nothing and all of a sudden there's, you know, our money is worth nothing. And I don't believe this is going to happen. Don't cut that clip and put it on YouTube, okay? I'm, I'm, this is just a hypothetical thing, okay? <laughs> I don't think America's going down. But if all of a sudden our money was worth nothing and we had uh, no gas to go anywhere and, and no place, nobody to repair our cars and our grocery store shut down, we had no electricity, right? Like, what would we do? I always have this thought that, like, at least I have a brother up in East Jordan who has a farm. And, like, I could, I could walk, I could get there, right? And he's got fruits and vegetables, I just realized my doomsday plan, I probably shouldn't have told you where it is. <laughs> it's south of here in Detroit area. <laughs> it's fair enough. My brother has a farm up there, so he's got fruits and vegetables and chickens and, and a wood-burning stove. We could at least survive, right? If the economy of all around us fails, at least the agriculture would be okay. God's saying, no, I'm going to take even that from you, but I'm going to take more. He says, he says, I'm going to take your culture too. Even you're going to be taken over into the hands of a master. And not some master who's going to take care of you, but a cruel master. Someone who does not have your interests in heart. You know, if you go to other cities and you recognize a little bit of different culture, how you feel kind of uneasy, right, about the people around you that live a little bit differently than you. And then you go to another country, it's even worse, right? When you fly, all of a sudden, they're using different money. They're speaking a different language. They drive on a different side of the road. All these, all these things that are, that are completely different. It's hard for you. You want to acclimate to that culture as quickly as you can, right? But imagine that that came to Michigan, came to Traverse City, that all of a sudden, everything that we hold dear in our culture, the way that we desire to live and want to live our lives, is gone. And we are handed over to a master that does not like us and not, uh, does not have our best interests in heart. And everything that we thought is important to us as a society and, a, and as a city would be wiped away. God's saying, I'm going to take that from you too. Even the way that you think you ought to live your life is going to be gone. Then Ron says that, that he will take their counsel. It says, even your counsel will give stupid advice, is the translation. Your counsel will give stupid advice, even politically. He says, I'm going to destroy this nation. Relationally, emotionally, economically, agriculturally, 
uh, culturally and politically. He says, I'm going to take it from every level. And you're going to be hurt. There's going to be destruction everywhere. And here's a really important turning point. Verse 17, here's what it says. Everyone to whom is mentioned will fear because the purpose that the Lord of hosts has purposed against them. Really important distinction about why this is all happening. Because the purpose of the Lord has purposed against them. It doesn't say that they overworked the fields and they, and they tried all these new crops and it failed and that's why it's all dry. They, they, they did it themselves. It doesn't say that, goodness, they couldn't get along. So that's why brother to brother thought and they fought with, with their other nations and other things because they just couldn't get along. They didn't like each other. Okay? It wasn't all these things that you could point to a cause. God says it's not going to happen because of what you did, but simply because I'm telling you it's going to happen. That's a difference, right? I feel like in, in our world we love causation. We love cause and effect in our world, and why wouldn't we, right? We like to know that if I act a certain way, people are going to treat me a certain way. If I'm kind to people, that's how I'm going to uh, be, be friendly with people, right? If I'm mean to people, people are going to mean back to me. There's a cause and effect to everything. That's how we live our lives, and that's how you ought to. With your jobs, right? If all of a sudden, if you're the first one there in the morning and you're working really hard and you've got new ideas and stuff and, and, you're, and you're with all your projects, you're the, you're the top guy just trying to push anything true and, and giving your heart and soul to every day while you're there at work, your boss is going to say, this is great. He's going to give you more, right? You're going uh, to get raises and promotions and those kind of things. We can point the effect of the raise and the promotion was the cause and that was that you simply worked your tail off. It's easy to point the correlation between that, right? The opposite is true too, though. If you come in at 11 o'clock and, and in every meeting you just kind of sit there and just kind of uh, doodle on your notes and then you let your projects go to everybody else, after a while you're going to have a sit down and say, listen, we're going to go in another direction. And all you can say is I, I understand because I can see the cause and effect of what I've done with my time while I'm an employee here, right? We love that cause and effect, but that is not what's happening to these people. They can't point to the fact that, well, we're given stupid counsel because we, we uh, have stupid people in charge. Or, man, we, we put all the wrong crops here. This is why. Or we've just got all these people coming in that are just mean. That, you know, this, that our culture is bad, right? It, there wasn't a cause for any of this. The reason it's happening is simply because God purposed it. Let's, we're going to put a, like a parenthetical pause for a moment here because uh, I think some of you are in the middle of that right now where there's something going on in your life where you're looking for a cause. Like there's a lot of things that go wrong in our life that we, we, can, we can see the cause to it right away. We know we did that. That was my bad. Okay, I can fix that somehow. We did that. But there's some things you say, why? Why is there this destruction? Why is this stuff going on in my life all the time? It could be that God says, because I purposed it. Not because of something you did or didn't do but simply because I'm trying to get your attention on something and I've purposed it to happen. Know the difference between things that we've caused and things that God has just simply purposed in our lives. It's an important change in the thing. So here's what happens. This would have been, if you're reading this, if you're Egypt and you're hearing this, it's not something that, this is not something that happened after the fact. It's saying this is what God did. It's saying this is what God's going to do. This would have been a devastating moment for them, right? And it was. If you look at Egypt now, total devastation since that point. Destruction on almost every front. If you think about what they were, almost they dominated almost a quarter of the world at the time, mightiest military, greatest economy, these huge feats of technology and, and uh, economical advances as they build these giant pyramids. Now, they're, they're ranked 102nd in the economy. Their military is about worth nothing. They're considered a third world country by the UN. They have been hit hard. Even to this day, not the same nation it was. They're not alone, by the way, in that. About every nation, not about every nation that has tried to dominate the world has been brought to its knees, right? We saw it with Greece and with Rome, Mongolia, even Great Britain, Germany. It's almost like Isaiah 19 is written to these nations that says, this is a warning to you who's going to try to take over and dominate the world. God says, no. 
That's, that's a place for God, right? So then here comes the turnover. All of Isaiah is about judgment and then about redemption, judgment and redemption. And here's what happens. God says this, when all this happens, this layer upon layer of destruction that's going to happen just simply because I've purposed it in that day, here's what he says. When all this happens in that day, this is verse 19, there will be an altar to the Lord in the heart of Egypt, a monument to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign and a witness to the Lord Almighty in the land of Egypt. When they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors, he will send them a savior and a defender, and he will rescue them. The Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians, and in that day they will acknowledge the Lord. They will worship with sacrifice and grain offerings. They will make vows to the Lord and keep them. The Lord will strike Egypt with a plague. He will strike them and then heal them. They will turn to the Lord and he will respond to their pleas and heal them. First God strikes the nation and then heals. Strikes them and then heals them. It's a fairly obvious statement, but I think it's worth uh, thinking through very quickly that nations are simply made up of individuals and people, right? I think it's really easy to read this whole passage as some foreign nation, not even America. Not even that, it's, it's, it's not just that it's not written at us uh, specifically, but it's not even written to America. It's written about a, a foreign nation. How easy it was to be to look at them and say, shame on them and, and everything that God did to them and well, good for you with this, with this point of redemption that they'll come back and that you'll plead with God and he'll listen, okay? It's very easy to just write it off because it's not pointed at us directly. But a nation is simply a group of individuals and people, right? How are societies made by people that make decisions based on individual accountability with other people with individual accountability? That's how cultures are made. That's how society is made. That's how policy is made. That's how nations are formed is by individuals, not simply by this collective group, but by individuals making individual decisions. G.K. Chesterton uh, said this, uh, he's, uh, he's dead now, but he's 50 years ago. Uh, he wrote this, he's, he read an article in a uh, news, not a newspaper, in a magazine. And that magazine article says, what is wrong with the world? And it, it was, the article was two things. One, it was trying to say, just throw your hands up. He's like, I don't know what's wrong with the world. But also he was trying to uh, illustrate some things that this author thought was wrong with the world. What is wrong with the world today? G.K. Chesterton writes to the author, to this magazine, and they post it in the front of the, in the magazine. It says, uh, Dear editor, in response to, what is, to your article, What is Wrong with the World? I am yours truly, G.K. Chesterton. What is wrong with the world today? He says, I am yours truly, G.K. Chesterton. That was the entirety of the letter. He recognized that it wasn't just some other nation, some other thing that was the problem, but rather the depravity and the sin in his own heart times everybody around him that created the problems in the world. So here's what I'd like to do. I, I, I want to make a recognition of something, and then I'm going to do something I don't want to be very careful about. So listen very carefully to my words, okay? Because I want to make sure that we don't, we don't do something inappropriate here. Uh, all promises made in the Bible are probably not to us, especially promises uh, to Israel. I think we ought to be really careful about how we take promises that were given to Israel at a certain time in a certain place and use them for us personally, right? If they were given over to an oppressor at a certain time, uh, we need to be careful about how we take that promise to ourselves, other than how it reveals the nature of God to us, right? But a promise of redemption that is given to a nation, not Israel, is us. So a promise that is given to Egypt here, this is something that we know. This reveals something about God, about how he treats us for sure. So what I'd like to do is, uh, and Meg, are you in the back there? My son is here somewhere, hopefully. There he is right there, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try something here. I want you to read this passage as, what's up, Jonah? Dude, you look sharp, man. This is Jonah. I want you to, I wanna read the passage again as something that is at an individual, don't put that up quite yet, at an individual rather than at a nation. 
at an individual rather than an issue. So I'm going to read this again, paraphrase, as though this is something that God is going to do for Jonah. Now listen, this is not a prophecy for or against Jonah. Okay, you guys understand that? If you're going to clip anything on YouTube, put that on there, okay? This is not a prophecy against Jonah, but it's a recognition that this is something that, even though it's a foreign nation, this is something for our own hearts. Hi, Nana. Because <laughs> one day, the Lord will strike this little boy with relational problems and emotional problems, economical problems. He will strike him maybe for his own cause <laughs> or maybe for something that the Lord has purposed from him. But in that day, think about this, guys. I'm going to paraphrase this. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the heart of Jonah, a monument to the Lord around his life. He will be a sign and a witness to the Lord Almighty. When he cries out to the Lord because of his oppressors, God will send Jonah a savior, a defender, and the Lord will rescue Jonah. So the Lord will make himself known to Jonah. And in that day, he will acknowledge the Lord. He will worship with sacrifice. He will make vows to the Lord and keep them. The Lord will strike Jonah. He will strike him and heal him. Jonah will turn to the Lord. And he will respond to Jonah's pleas and heal him. What a difference it makes when you level it at an individual, at a person who has not yet happened to, right? I feel a lot of us are in the middle of these things, buddy. Go right ahead down there. Take your time, man. No problem. What a difference it makes when we're not thinking about it as something leveled at a country far off but rather at our own personal hearts, what that redemption might look like in that day when God has had his purpose for us and against us. And we finally come and we say, Lord, I want to, you're an altar in my heart to you. I want a monument to you around my life. I want to acknowledge you with my heart and with my soul. And when I plead to you, when I, when I beg for you to heal me, you'll send a savior and a defender and you will rescue me passage gets better, by the way, because here's what it says next. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Assyria will come into Egypt and Egypt into Assyria. Okay, the world is coming together. Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be a third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, catch this, blessed be Egypt, my people. Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Isn't it crazy that, that a nation that he will level and decimate so much that he will turn around and when they call out to him, he calls them his people. You know how that changes how we should view the world and how we should view our, our enemies, uh, domestic and, and foreign, right? How we should view our political enemies and, and our enemies of faith all, all around. All that, all that saying is this, is that if they bow their knee to Christ, God is the only one that takes ancient foes and turns them into eternal brothers and sisters in Christ. This knowledge ought to change the way that we view people around the world, Right? and how we view what the gospel is and how we should pray for people. Because even those who are persecuting Christians around the world or who have ideologies so much different than ours about how the world should work, the Bible says this, that the Lord will strike them and heal them. When they turn to the Lord, he will respond to their pleas and he will heal them. That's everybody. This is not Israel. But these are God's people because they've been grafted in because of what God has done to them for them. I'm gonna, I have just a couple of closing thoughts here and then I'm done. One, one, uh, one quotation and then I want to finish with, with maybe some how this uh, applies to your heart here. So we've been looking at God or uh, Isaiah as a whole. It's God's unfolding plan, right? An unfolding plan, that's, that's been the theme throughout the last several months about how does what is happening in Isaiah here, how does this apply to us today? How did it apply when Jesus came and after he died and with a new covenant? How does this a part of God's unfolding plan? 
I want to read the words of a guy, his name is Malcolm Muggeridge, uh, who is also dead, naming dead people today. Uh, he, uh, he wrote this back in the 80s about nations and the power of nations. Listen to this very carefully. Here's what he says. We look back on history and what do we see? Empires rising and falling, revolutions and counter-revolutions, wealth accumulated, wealth dispersed, one nation dominant and then another. Shakespeare or speaks of the rise and fall of great ones that ebb and flow with the moon. In one lifetime, I've seen my own countryman. He's British. He says, in one, in one lifetime, I've seen my own countrymen ruling over a quarter of the world that the great majority of them convinced in what is still a popular song that the God who made them mighty shall make them mightier yet. I've heard a crazed crack Austrian proclaim to the world the establishment of a German Reich that would last a thousand years. I've heard an Italian clown announce that he would restart the calendar to begin with his own assumption of power. I've seen America wealthier and in terms of military weaponry more powerful than the rest of the world put together. So that had the American people chosen, they could have outdone a Caesar or an Alexander in the range and scale of their conquests. All in one lifetime, he says, all gone. England, now part of a, a tiny island off the coast of Europe, threatened with dismemberment and even bankruptcy. Hitler and Mussolini, only uh, dead, only remembered in infamy. Stalin, a forbidden name in the regime, he helped found and dominate for some three decades. America haunted by fears of running out of the precious fluid that keeps their motorways rolling. All in one lifetime, all gone. Gone with the wind, he said. What does that show us about God's unfolding plan? <laughs> Except for that individual and national power is so short-lived. And yet God's mighty hand is consistent through all of it. You know, the first part of that prophecy has clearly been fulfilled, right? If we look at the devastation that they've seen in all these different categories, uh, that's, where, that's where they are now for the most part. Okay, we've seen this come true. The second half of it, however, as far as the research and commentaries, everything we read, has not been fulfilled in any government or any person save for one. And that's the person of Jesus Christ. He says, when you call on my name, Jesus' name, I will send a savior and a rescuer and I will deliver you. Guys, I, I feel like a lot of our lives are in between those two things, right? A lot of it is the destruction that we've seen in our lives. Some of it you can point to causes to. Some of it you can point to causes for the problems and the things that we've seen. Some of them you think, God, God, why have you purposed this in my life? But we're in between those two things, right? That we've seen crazy, crazy destruction on every level in our life, but we're waiting for that second part of the healing to come. I'm going to read it to you again. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the heart of Egypt, of you and of me. A monument to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign and a witness to the Lord Almighty in the land. They will cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors. He will send them a savior and a defender and he will rescue them. The Lord will make himself known. And in that day, they will acknowledge the Lord. They will worship with sacrifice. They will make vows to the Lord and keep them. The Lord will strike Egypt. He will strike us, strike us, and heal us. Then we will turn to the Lord and we will respond. And he will heal us. I think it's time, uh, Pastor Rick, if you could come up and, and begin. We're going to sing a song called Healer. That was saying before. I think a lot of us have been struck by the Lord struck over and over. Sometimes we recognize the cause. Sometimes we think, why? What is going on? Just because God has purposed it, and that's enough. We've been struck over and over and over again. Where is the healing? I think we ought to say, Lord, it's time for us to plead with him. With whatever the oppressor is in your life, whatever it is, to say, God, send, us, send me something. Send me a deliverer and a savior to rescue me. But if it's with our relationships, Lord, heal our relationships and our marriages. If it's with your emotional, if you've been emptied out on the inside, Lord, send someone, Jesus Christ, to fill that need in them. 
If it's economical, whatever it is, find how you need to be healed. Don't bring it to anyone else except for Jesus Christ, our Lord. May you know him and you will know the freedom that he gives you. Thank you.